Good afternoon to you all. I'm pleased to welcome you to the IIEA webinar, and we're delighted to be joined today by Elizabeth Broad, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, who has been generous enough to take time out of her busy schedule to speak to us. Elizabeth Broad will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll go into Q&A with uh, the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on the screen in front of you. But please feel free to send your questions in throughout the sessions as they occur to you. And we'll come to them uh, once our speaker has finished their presentation. I, I would ask that you would um, keep your questions succinct, that you give your full name and your affiliation uh, when asking questions. Um, just a reminder that today's uh, presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. So please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So now I'll formally introduce Elizabeth Broad and hand her over to you at the end of this brief introduction. Elizabeth is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where she focuses on defense against gray zone threats. She is also a columnist with foreign policy and political Europe and the author of The Defender's Dilemma, Identifying and Deterring Gray Zone Aggression. The book was published 2022. Elizabeth is writing a book about globalization and geopolitics for Yale, University Press, and she's a member of Gallus Technologies and Advisory Board member and a member of the UK National Preparedness Commission and a member of the Steering Committee of the Aurora uh, Forum. We're really looking forward to what I'm sure will be a fascinating reflection from Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, Zoom is all yours. Thank you very much, Mark, and, and thank you uh, for the invitation to to join you and it's it's uh, such a pleasure to be talking about gray zone aggression not because it's a pleasant subject it's an unpleasant subject but it, it's uh, it's such a pleasure because uh, many many people many leading institutions including yours are beginning to think about gray zone aggression and yours has your organization has obviously thought about it longer than many others but the great thing is that that the conversation is happening and i mean remember even three or four years ago when when uh, when i uh, tried to articulate or articulated various gray zone threats, many people's response was, well, you know, it's it's not that big of a deal. And now we are realizing collectively, I think as, as Western societies, uh, that it is a big deal because with gray zone aggression, you can, um, you can cripple societies um, in in ways that are as, almost as damaging or or, um, or as damaging or even more damaging than using military force, and yet you can do so with impunity because we as Western societies are well set up to defend ourselves with uh, against military attacks. And yes, those military attacks would still be damaging, but we would know what to do. And with gray zone aggression, we don't know what to do because it's not a military attack, and yet it's not nothing. So that raises the question, uh, what is gray zone aggression? Uh, it is the use of, um, uh, of uh, aggressive means below the threshold of armed military violence. And what's interesting is that it can be both legal and illegal means. So if we think about, uh, for example, subversive business practices, um, in many cases, those uh, practices are legal, for example, uh, acquisitions of companies. And when it comes to acquisitions of companies, that's something that, that is uh, happens every single day of the year. And, and in fact, it's, it's part of the lifeblood of, of any uh, free market society. And so um, that, that is how it's supposed to work. But then um, relatively recently, countries began noticing that, oops, maybe, uh, there is a strategy behind the sort of acquisitions that Chinese companies are, do, are, are conducting in our countries. And, and people realize that, oh, Chinese companies have bought up many of our uh, cutting edge technology companies, and they are no longer uh, Irish or Swedish or British or German companies. They are uh, Chinese owned companies focusing on the Chinese market uh, 
and uh, their IP now belongs to the so intellectual property now belongs to the Chinese owner. Uh, then uh, uh, gray zone aggression can use illegal means as well, and that includes, for example, uh, weaponizing migrants, which we have seen Belarus do um, to to try to to weaken the European Union. It's uh, uh, it brought, as, as I'm sure you all know, it brought um, migrants to Belarus and transported them to the border uh, borders of uh, Poland, Lith Lithuania and Latvia and encouraged them to, 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 to try to cross the border illegally. And uh, that put those countries um, in a dilemma because you, you don't want to be inhumane by pushing back people who say they want to apply for asylum. On the other hand, you have to act because this is um, this is an effort by another country to weaken yours uh, by very, in a very sinister manner, using human beings. And that's what, what those countries did in the end. They put up fences and, and, and uh, only let people through who had some sort of medical condition. Uh, but um, there were many people who said, well, you know, you are being inhumane. So gray zone aggression can, uh, can take on all kinds of, of shapes and forms. And that's what makes it so difficult to, to predict. Um, it's not like military aggression where you have a pretty good idea of what the adversary can do because you know what sort of equipment the adversary has. And then you just have to figure out in which formation and at what time the adversary uh, might use it. But gray zone aggression really can be anything um, anywhere. And uh, the Americans are a good example of why the wake up call that is taking place now is necessary, uh, because they didn't think that the anywhere would include them. Uh, they are so used to, to uh, their and geographic position in the world, protecting them against national security threats. And then we saw uh, in 2021, May of 2021, the hacking uh, attack, the ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline. Um, and Colonial Pipeline is a pipeline that, that supplies uh, fuel of all kinds to the East Coast. Half of that fuel is supplied by Colonial. And the Russian hacking or, 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 uh, yeah, hacker group uh, targeted uh, Colonial and, and managed to, to cripple or occupy parts of it and then issued its ransom um, demand. Uh, and that then caused uh, Colonial to shut down the whole pipeline, which is what you have to do. And that would have been manageable, but uh, people then, ordinary citizens then responded by saying, oh, there's going to be a shortage. I, I better fill up on, on petrol because otherwise I won't be able to drive to work. So people uh, uh, stockpiled uh, petrol to be able to get to work, which makes is a logical response from a, an individual perspective, it's it's an absolutely disastrous response from a societal perspective because uh, the East Coast ran out of petrol and it was an absolutely crippling shortage. And, and the, the, the federal government in the end had to step in and, and release uh, fuel from the fuel reserves. So uh, that again illustrates how it, yeah, how gray zone aggression can strike anywhere. East Coast uh, drivers on uh, on the US East Coast had expected that they would be at any sort of risk of, of gray zone aggression. And another uh, recent example in the US, which highlights that can be anything, anytime, was the Chinese balloon and the Chinese uh, spy balloon. And the Chinese spy balloon has, I must say, done wonders to raise the profile of gray zone aggression. Um, it was clearly a balloon. Uh, and it was a balloon in US airspace. And yes, there have balloon, been balloons in the past, but the fact that ordinary citizens could see it uh, meant that the US government had to do something. Uh, so the US has a powerful military that is very good at, at deterring uh, aggression. But here was something flying into US airspace without permission. So th that is gray zone aggression. You get to do something. But because it wasn't a fighter jet, it wasn't clear what was to be done. Um, it would have been escalatory for, for the US Air Force to shoot it down. Um, but yet, if it, if it keeps flying through, uh, if any object keeps flying through US airspace, 
uh, without permission, then it looks like uh, the US military is not able to defend the country's borders, including its airspace. So something had to be done. And, and so the military had to have a, a good think about what needed to be done. And in the end, as you know, they shut it down off the coast, uh, off the East Coast. But even then, um, and China uh, accused the US military of, uh, of escalation and overreaction, which is exactly um, the, the dilemma that the defender always faces. If you do nothing, then you're essentially implying that the gray zone aggression is that you don't know what to do. If you do something, uh, then the perpetrator can, uh, if, if the perpetrator is, is, uh, has been identified, the perpetrator can accuse you of escalating. And uh, this is one of the defender's dilemmas. The other dilemma is that you don't always know, know who the perpetrator is. Uh, with cyber aggression, you may have a, a, good, uh, a good idea of who the perpetrator is, the state backing the, uh, conducting the aggression. Um, or uh, backing it, but you may not have strong enough evidence to be able to, to publicly state which country it was. Um, uh, so uh, the uh, identity of the perpetrator is one challenge um, and the response is one challenge. And then uh, another challenge is, do you have, can you respond to every single act of gray zone aggression? Uh, and if not, uh, where do you draw the line? And um, if you look at, at cyber aggression, it's just not possible to respond, uh, meaning to punish every act of, uh, of cyber aggression, even uh, not even every act that is, is uh, conducted or backed by, by hostile governments. Um, but ab above which level do you respond? And that's where it's not really clear uh, where where the where we should put the threshold as as liberal democracies, um, and uh, another example of that is um, if you look at uh, what's happening, what happened last week in the in the Taiwan Strait, where in response to uh, President uh, Tsai's uh, meeting with Speaker McCarthy in California. Uh, China retaliated, and uh, not in a military way, because she she is entitled to have meetings. But China they did want to retaliate, and it did so by sending out what they called an inspection flotilla, and um, into the Taiwan Strait. And this inspection flotilla uh, could, the Chinese government said, inspect the commercial vessels uh, traveling through this uh, this this strait. And we should remember that the Taiwan Strait is one of the world's busiest waterways, uh, about half of, of all container ships pass through the Taiwan Strait. And, and in the middle of the Taiwan Strait is the median line, which is not an official uh, maritime border. It's just, a, it's an unofficial one that has been observed by, by China and, and Taiwan for decades. Well, this maritime, uh, this, this inspection flotilla gave itself the permission or the government, the Chinese government gave it the permission to inspect uh, all kinds of vessels in the Taiwan Strait. Now it didn't do it this time, uh, but it may do it next time. And, and the question is, uh, and, and if it does it, that means, uh, first of all, that, that global shipping be, will be massively disrupted because once you start um, conducting inspections uh, in, a, in a body of water where the, the passable part is very narrow, uh, the traffic, the maritime traffic will back up very quickly, will, which will cause disruption to global shipping. Um, and the question is, uh, how do you respond then? Or if you don't respond the first time, what is the number of times that you can tolerate before, before you respond, meaning uh, before you retaliate? And if you, if you decide to retaliate, with which means do you retaliate? Um, uh, and we should remember that, that um, causing disruption uh, to global shipping is, is obviously extremely harmful to lots of countries, but it would also a disruption or inspection of uh, vessels uh, traveling through the Taiwan Strait would also frighten the global shipping companies away from from uh, from sailing to Taiwan because they would say, "Oh, if we are inspected again, that's going to be even more disruption. We would better uh, find alternative ports. We better stop uh, trading or uh, transporting cargo to and from Taiwan." Uh, so all of this 
uh, every time it, it raises a question, when do you respond? From which level do you consider uh, gray zone aggression um, unacceptable? Um, and uh, uh, another example of that is uh, the artificial islands that uh, China has built in the Ch South China Sea. Uh, now they are islands with military installations on them. It's, it's clear that they are islands, but when China first started pouring concrete there on, on, on the uh, bottom of the sea in the in the South China Sea, countries said, well, you know, it's it's just a bit of concrete and we can we can let it pass. Uh, well, at every step, countries said, well, you know, what can we do? And and it's just a little bit of, of construction. And now the islands are there, and it's too late uh, to retaliate. Um, another form of uh, of gray zone aggression is, of course, disinformation, which is not uh, also not illegal, but which uh, causes enormous disruption. Uh, to our societies. It's it's much more well known than, than these other forms of grace and aggression, simply because we have been aware of it for, for uh, years now, especially since the 2016 uh, US presidential election campaign. Uh, but it continues to permeate our societies. And uh, we are seeing, uh, especially with regards to, to the war in Ukraine, that, that um, people uh, of, of all political persuasions uh, unwittingly, unwittingly make themselves into conduits for falsehoods. Uh, some are uh, maybe acting on behalf of Russia or have sympathies for, for Russia, but others are just, they, they just share content they like and, and they, they don't have the, um, the skills to verify that information or they are too lazy to verify it. And I think, frankly speaking, most of us don't have the skill to verify a lot of content that, that is shared on social media in particular. So uh, that is damaging, but what is even more damaging than, than, the, than specific pieces of disinformation is that it creates this feeling among people that you can't really trust any information. So it's, um, it's, uh, it becomes a very, People develop a very cynical attitude towards information that it's you know it, yeah I may I, I think it's true therefore it's true or why what does it matter whether it's true uh, I like it and if we think about the consequences for that it, uh, consequences of that it can be absolutely uh, crippling to our societies uh, that are based on intelligent discourse based on facts if we can't agree on facts I, I worry that our democracies will become ungovernable if we dis if we dis uh, discuss uh, and debate based on different sets of facts how can we possibly have uh, an intelligent uh, let alone productive uh, debate in our societies so that's where we are and and the, the challenge is that um, uh, hostile countries uh, or um, actors operating on their behalf can keep innovating, whereas we, uh, on the defender side, uh, can't base uh, our response on, on previous events because the other side can come, can, can come up with something completely different. But what we can do is raise awareness of this and, and bring uh, the public with us um, because this aggression really affects everybody. Um, and, and that's why I think people are, would be more motivated to do that part, to keep that country safe, whether it be Ireland or, or any other country, simply because we don't want our societies um, uh, disrupted or, or um, uh, brought down or harmed by, by uh, hostile states. I think we all enjoy our well-functioning countries and, 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 and our uh, um, our freedom and 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 um, the, the opportunities that that we have within our countries. So it's we have a fantastic fantastic way of life, a fantastic quality of life in our countries, and uh, all of these uh, different forms of disruption and and and, and gray zone aggression uh, would harm uh, or do harm that way of life. And so if we think about people's attitude generally towards the military, it varies in, in, uh, in some quarters, people are very willing to, to serve in the military, uh, whereas others are less willing. But when it comes to gray zone aggression, why would, uh, I, 
I, I'm, I'm convinced that everybody would want to be part of, of uh, minimizing the harm that grazing and aggression can do simply because uh, we, we want to maintain our way of life in our societies. And that I think is a fantastic basis on which to, to try to, to involve not just all parts of, of government, but uh, the private sector, the third sector, and the wider population in, 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 uh, in, in making the country safer. So if you think about what ordinary citizens can do, uh, the first thing, of course, is information literacy. And, and I remain convinced that if libraries, public libraries were to often uh, offer uh, information literacy classes, courses, a lot of people would take them because I, I, I think it's embarrassing if you don't know how to tell uh, truth from, from falsehoods. And I, I think also we'll reach the point where employers will require that, that uh, prospective employees have some sort of information literacy certification simply because you can't have a you can't run a company where in, in our information econ economy where employees don't know what constitutes or how to verify information that is just too risky today uh, so information literacy is one step and it's interesting that the Finnish government um, calls information literacy um, a civic competence which uh, is absolutely the right way of putting it uh, then you can uh, you can uh, involve the the wider public or parts of the public by training them in resilience such as you know, uh, uh, first aid, um, disaster preparedness, disaster response, uh, so that when, if something happens, whether it be uh, uh, caused by mother nature, like a pandemic, or whether it be caused by hostile set, that you have a critical mass of people who know what to do. And, and uh, I'm speaking from the UK, here in the UK, um, young people who are part of the uh, uh, DOE schemes, so the Duke of, Duke of Edinburgh scheme, uh, did fantastic work during the pandemic, um, uh, essentially doing chores for, for elderly uh, and isolated people who, uh, who couldn't very, who couldn't really look after themselves or, or, or go to the supermarket during the pandemic. Those young people did it. Uh, and the Duke of Edinburgh scheme is a fantastic scheme. I think it can be replicated uh, in other countries and also with, with uh, people in the UK who are not part of the DOE scheme. For example, people who are a little bit older. Um, and if we look at uh, when a crisis occurs in different countries, people then uh, invariably want to, to help. But I think if we can organize ourselves before crisis, then we, we are in a much better position to, to tackle the crisis and, and uh, uh, reduce the harm it does. And the other thing uh, that is really important is uh, involving the private sector. And, and um, it used to be until very recently that the private sector was seen as uh, yeah, just going about its business. Uh, companies uh, um, make money, pay taxes, and, and as a result, uh, contribute to the prosperity in our countries. And we thought that, that was, that's where their um, obligations ended. But now what we're seeing is, is two different things. First, that they are, they are being targeted by grace and aggression simply because of, of where they are based. Uh, it can be either through, through cyber attacks, and uh, I would love to, to hear uh, if, if, uh, if you all, I, 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 wish I could do a, uh, a show of hands, but I can't. But anyway, uh, maybe we can uh, get some sort of indication in the Q&A of who remembers not Petya, which was a, a crippling cyber attack. Uh, six years ago conducted by Russia against Ukraine, but it then traveled on and brought down the, 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 some of the biggest multinationals uh, in the world, including Merck, the pharmaceutical company, which was then left unable to manufacture uh, its, uh, its uh, crucial HPV vaccine. Uh, <laughs> that, that is just a, 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 a hugely damaging effect. Uh, it brought on Maersk, which is large, large world, the world's largest shipping company. It brought down Mondelez, which is a, um, a snack giant. Uh, it brought down uh, uh, the company that makes lots of the household goods we use here in the UK. Uh, and they, of course, had nothing to do with, I mean, they don't have any any adversaries that would wish their meal simply because they are Merck or Mask or, or, or Mondelez. 
uh, they they were just targets. Uh, on that occasion, they were accidental targets because the the, uh, the aggression was directed against Ukraine in the first place. On other occasions, companies are targets are are the intended targets simply because of where they are based. That's what happened to Colonial Pipeline. But then on top of that, uh, it's not just cyber attacks. It's uh, it's um, attacks punishing Western companies if their if their home government does something that uh, a hostile government doesn't agree with or uh, uh, feels uh, feels offended by. So, for example, when Lithuania invited Taiwan to open a representative office in Vilnius, uh, China responded by blocking imports of uh, all uh, Lithuanian goods. So the, the, those Lithuanian goods, which were also parts of, of uh, products made in other countries, they were just stuck uh, in Chinese ports. But Lithuanian, Lithuanian companies, uh, they consider themselves neutral and they discover they are no longer neutral. And the same thing happened to Australian winemakers when Australia called for an investigation into the origins of COVID. China responded by slapping uh, punitive tariffs on Australian wine and Australian winemakers as a result lost their biggest export market. Australian winemakers don't consider themselves geopolitical. Well, they had a rude awakening. And we're seeing that over and over with different companies, uh, H&M, uh, uh, Ericsson, um, and, and, and so on. And there is no way a company can protect itself against geopolitically motivated um, uh, harm being uh, being uh, done to it, and that too is based on aggression because no no company has a right to export to any other country uh, under particular conditions. Yes, you can play, you can complain to the World Trade Organization, but uh, you it, it's it's not it's not uh, an egregious violation of the case that you uh, the, that the home government would then sort of take action against the offending government. So the company really is on its own. Uh, and uh, for example, what happened to, to Ericsson in China was that Sweden decided to not to uh, use Huawei for its 5G. Um, and uh, then lo and behold, China, uh, Ericsson, which is one of the world's most globalized companies, has a, uh, used to have a massive market share in China, now less massive, but nevertheless, its biggest market anywhere, uh, it found itself essentially shut out from the Chinese market. Well, Ericsson doesn't have the right to have a certain percent of the Chinese market, uh, but uh, it had been operating on the basis that, you know, this is a globalized economy, companies compete against one another and the, the best company wins. Well, uh, Ericsson was punished because of something the Swedish government had done. So on uh, as a result of that, companies now are motivated in a way that they haven't been in the past, motivated to try to be part of a, the solution, to try to work with the government to, to reduce the harm and, and ideally to, to try to predict it um, uh, so that uh, companies have a better way of, of trying to, or, or of deflating the harm uh, before um, before it occurs, or at least to, to reduce it when, when it does occur. And this is so different uh, from the way companies have operated in the past, where they only consider tactical risks like uh, corruption, kidnappings, and so forth. And that's the basis on which they did business abroad. No more. Now they have to consider geopolitics. And it's interesting uh, that uh, 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 there is an annual survey done by Willis Charles Watson, which is a large a global uh, insurance broker. Uh, and every year, uh, Willis Tars Watson releases a survey of political risk, meaning risks other than the ones caused by Mother Nature. And um, uh, this survey last year, when it was released last spring, showed that uh, China, executives now consider China the riskiest countries to do business in. Um, and that's it used to be Iran, Angola, those sort of countries. Now, now it's China. And that's just a sign of how much things have changed in recent years. Uh, I know my time is up, but uh, what the, the bottom line is that it, it, we are uh, we have entered uncharted waters, the globalized economy meeting geopolitics, where almost anything can be instrumentalized for gray zone aggression. And that is uh, depressing and, and really quite frightening. The good news is that in the past, uh, we have governments haven't utilized 
civil society, including the private sector, to try to keep society safe. So we have this uh, totally untapped potential, which is where I think we can build uh, uh, lots of uh, expertise uh, and capability and collaboration uh, to, to try to keep our country safe, even though it's not possible to completely shut gray zone aggression out. And um, that also frees the military up to, to focus on what they are really good at, which is military defense. If we think that we can use the military for gray zone uh, defense, then it means that the military has to do lots of things that are not the military's uh, core expertise, while, and it would also take them away from what is that core expertise, and that would be hugely damaging. damaging. So with that, uh, over to you, Mark.